a tablet. And he's held, he told me it's a game changer. So guess what? I'm going to see if I can change my game up and do a little better because I'm still getting used to this uh, broadcast thing. And uh, I was not born to be a televangelist, I'm telling you right now. But I am trying to utilize some equipment that might help me read a little faster. And then you're saying, oh good, maybe he'll be done with his sermon a little faster. But just to, to make you back off a little bit, every time at Harmony when I come into the pulpit with this many books, Everybody knows they're in, they're in trouble uh, because I'm going to go for a bit, but not really. So what I want to talk about today, uh, we're in this series called Better Things. It's in the book of Hebrews. And I want to begin with just something very simple. I dug around in my strong box at home. And uh, that's where I keep all the special things, special documents, birth certificates, uh, records of our children perhaps, uh, something from my uh, uncles who were veterans that I've kept. But two really important items I found in there. I don't know if you can see this. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. Last will and testament of John T. Hocko. That's me. Because, you know, you start to get up there, you don't think about it much when you're young, but I started thinking about this. This is back a, a bit, the year 2000. That's a bit, 20 years ago. I went to my lawyer, who's also a friend, and said, you know, I want to be sure that my wishes are established, that after I'm gone, my children are impacted by what I say should happen. And so, and everybody I think understands this, we develop a last will and testament. And uh, what, I don't know why that's funny, but apparently it is. Oh, I tapped my mic. Hello, everyone. So I have all this paperwork in this little file, and inside are uh, attestations, people signing, legal positions and people, and my signature is on it. But I have another one. This one is dated 2000. This one, the new one, the other one is 2013 because some things changed in our circumstances and I wanted to make sure that my final wishes were up to date. And so far I think this one is okay. I might have to give it another look. But the whole point of a will and testament is to assure that what you want to see happen happens. And let me, oh, this is a hard question every, okay, class, all the kids out there, by the way, I didn't do anything special this week or make a fool of myself for the kids, but I'll think about that for the next few weeks. Which one do you think is valid? It's not a trick question. The most recent one, the newest one, the new one is the valid one. I've got it in writing. So the new covenant supersedes the Old Covenant. I think everybody gets where I'm going. That's what Hebrews is all about, and my title today is Get It in Writing. We're going to be reading in a minute chapter 7, verse 17 through 22. And by the way, just so you know, Hebrews by one author was referred to as the book of the diatheke. How do you like that for fancy Greek? It simply means of the covenant. The book about the covenant, the whole thing is about this wonderful covenant that God has made a deal with and settled for assurance for us, and that's the good news that we can enjoy. So I think Christians today, you may be encouraged by what we look at. If you're wondering who this Jesus person is, I hope it becomes a little more clear for you. But let me say this, as we've been plowing through the book of Hebrews, which will be my retirement preaching assignment, I think, because it'll be about 12 years before I'm done. Uh, I've been concerned that some of us might be a little weary of the redundancies, especially in the next three or four chapters. It seems to get redundant. Now, if you were a Jewish seminary student like the original listeners were, you'd be fascinated. You'd be tuning in like listening to an opera with the best aria being sung. You'd be just enraptured. But we American folks, uh, we tend to like McDonald's to get through fast, you know, and it's like, okay, I already got this. 
So because it might seem a little redundant, I'm going to lift some of the most outstanding texts, if I could, in the next few weeks to highlight those things. And uh, you can do some of the reading yourself. In fact, I hope by the time we're done with this, all of you have read the whole book of Hebrews through, maybe a couple of times. All teachers right now are exempt from that assignment. Uh, because they are Zooming themselves to death, right? Or uh, Google classes or whatever. So I'm going to highlight some things, and I'm going to move along a little more quickly in the next few chapters. For example, I skipped over something. Um, the last time we were talking about Abraham giving a tithe to Melchizedek, this great high priest, and at the end of that section, we won't even look at it now, chapter 7, verse 10, it says, you know, um, what was his name? Aaron's uh, family, Levi, paid tithes to Melchizedek through his great-grandfather, Abraham, because he was still in the loins of, Mel of Abraham when Melchizedek met him. There's a brain teaser for you. Shall we s stop and park on that for about 12 hours and try to under No, forget it. We're going to come back to that because it does show up later on. The subject does. What does that mean in chapter 11? Okay, that was just for fun to aggravate you. Let's move along. The text that we're looking at today is preceded by the few verses in between that one and where we'll start reading in a minute. And it's all about the Old Testament priesthood. The Old Testament priesthood was selected out of the tribe of Levi, and then out of the tribe of Levi, Aaron and all of his sons were the successors, the high priest, the priesthood of the children of Israel. And they had to repetitive, repetitively bring offerings on behalf of the people. People could bring offerings, sometimes for atonement, sometimes to give thanks to God, to worship God. We call it today tithes and offerings, but in those days it was in the form of a lamb or a food or whatever, and it was brought into the priesthood. And their job was to offer those things to God on behalf of the people, but also to bring back from God to the people his blessings, maybe forgiveness, maybe direction, instruction, the Levites and the priests were the teachers, the pastors, if you will, the teaching pastors of that generation. Can I just stop for one second? Because people might be listening and thinking, who cares? You know, I'm not Jewish. My background, it doesn't ring any bells for me. And what's the point? All religions, our, our, uh, our uh, associate pastor, Tim Strait, he, uh, he has been studying, working on his degrees, and we've been talking about his religious classes, religion, world religions. Do you know, all have a common thing. They all have a commonality. They believe that there's some kind of supreme something, even if it's the universe, there's some kind of broken relationship between us and whoever that is, and somehow something needs to be made right. They all have the same idea. It doesn't matter unless you're a confirmed, dyed-in-the-wool atheist, in which case you're convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt there's nothing beyond this. Nothing. Nothing. Zero. Just trying to help you out out there. If you're thinking, well, I don't know that there's nothing, well, then you're not an atheist, so don't use that word. You're an agnostic. You're not sure. Anyway, they all have the same problem. Something is built into us that says, we know we've messed up, and something needs to be made right. And the priesthood was the go-between, and every culture and every worship uh, system has their high priests or priests or kahunas or... Uh, pastors or imams or whatever to try to help bridge and help us understand the gap between us and whatever our view of a divine being is. In our case, we believe it's God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, Jesus' his Son, and the Spirit. That's the God that we worship. Melchizedek comes on the scene in the Old Testament. And so in the case of Jesus, God says, I know we have all of this heredity, I'm going to bypass that, and with a solemn oath, I'm going to commission my son, the eternal son of God, to be high priest forever. He's going to not only be the priest, he's going to be the sacrifice, he's going to die, he's going to rise from the dead and live forever, and that's why Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We don't know his beginning. It doesn't mean he didn't have parents. Of course he did. We just never heard about him. We don't know what happened to him after, and he has no children as far as we know. We don't know anything. So he's a picture of Jesus, eternal in the past, 
eternal into the future, even in resurrection form. So now we pick up our text today. Chapter 7, verse 17. You can follow along. For it is witness of him, Jesus, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. Oh boy, we're going to have to come back to that. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. There's a key phrase, through which we draw near to God. Anybody out there trying to draw near to God? There are some, yeah. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, the Old Testament Levites and the priesthood through Aaron, they became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, that's God speaking in a psalm, thou art a priest forever. And here's the key text. So much the more also, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The guarantee of a better covenant. Collateral. Anybody know what that is? <laughs> Surety. I have kids. Sometimes they've needed to get something where we didn't have enough money. Guess who had to co-sign? Collateral. If this one doesn't pay up, guess who we're coming after? And that's the story, friends. God has provided Jesus as surety for us. Ultimately, he's going to come to Jesus, and he always, Jesus always comes through. Always comes through. So let me give the reason now to unpack why we're looking at this text and why it's so, so important to have this collateral, this assurance, this surety of a guarantee of a new covenant that you might have it in writing, if I may say so. A few weeks back, I uh, quoted that very spiritual movie. Every time I say that, people go, oh, here it comes. It's a joke. But this one really was spiritual. It was M. Night Shyamalan's film, Signs, the one with the uh, aliens invading the world and the protagonist, the primary character, is played by Mel Gibson, Graham, who was a priest, an Episcopal priest, who had turned his back on his business and on God. And the, the title, Signs, is not just about the crop circles. It's really about God giving Graham signs that he was watching out for him. So it really is a spiritual movie. Uh, you do what you want, whether you want to go see it, all right? In that film, Graham goes into a drugstore to pick up a prescription. The girl behind the counter knows him as father, priest. And she knows that this alien invasion is happening. And not unlike our COVID drama, everything's coming apart at the seams. People are frightened. And she's scared. And when he comes to the counter, she says, Father, can I ask you a question? He goes, remember, I'm not a father. I know, I know, but with all of this going on, I'm really, I'm really nervous. And what she wants is forgiveness. She's asking him, is it wrong to use these words? And he goes, well, it depends on the context. <laughs> and they say, well, what about these words? And they get worse and worse. And he says, yeah, those are bad words. You're sinning, in other words. And she needs to have a clear conscience. That's what's bothering her. I thought that's a great picture of the human race. Ultimately, we need two things. Ultimately, we seek out a spiritual counselor, a priest, or whatever, because I need two things. I need either absolution when I fail, or I need guidance to know how to not fail. I need absolution when I sin. I need guidance to know how to please God, how not to sin, how to win at this thing called life. And the priest has that job of two directional work. One, bringing sin and asking for forgiveness and, and absolving the person who comes as well as giving direction into the future. Jesus' priesthood is permanent and effectual. It's the ultimate priesthood. There is none better, a guaranteed collateral on our behalf. By the way, 
We just passed the Easter season. I missed a beautiful window, an opportunity to preach right out of Hebrews. You may remember that in the book of Romans, it says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. Guess what else he was declared by the resurrection of the dead? He was declared high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. His priesthood is based on his never-ending life, his resurrection life. He lives forever, and that's why 725 says, it follows then that his power to save those who come to God through him is absolute. He is able to save to the uttermost, the King James Version says. Save without restraint. Save completely, since he lives forever to intercede for them. That's an aside. That's free. It's not in the notes. No charge. Absolution and cleansing. Let's talk about this. Old Testament had continual sacrifices, a picture of what was planned in the future, an ultimate saving act that would end all of that necessary ritual, the coming of Jesus. Here's what the scripture says, Hebrews 7, 27. He has no need to offer sacrifices every day as the high priests do, first for their own sins and only then for those of the people. This he did once and for all by offering himself. New Jerusalem Bible uses that phrase, once and for all, which I thought communicates it the best. Once and for all, he has taken care of our guilt. I'm not going to read from it. I'm just going to uh, recommend it. I've done it many times. This book called The Cross of Christ by John R. Stott. An excellent, excellent theological explanation of why there has to be a payment why there has to be a shedding of blood to understand what sin really is. And the biblical language is this. Sin is either missing the mark. In other words, you should be living up here, not here. So you miss the mark. Or a deliberate crossing of a line. I'd say all of us, if we're honest, are guilty of both. Somewhere along the line. We miss the mark. Or we deliberately go, I'm crossing that line. And I hate to admit it, but I've seen it in my own spirit in the last two weeks. I, I'm going to cross that line, you little brat. That's what it is, being a little brat, right? See, I'm just coming clean, you know. I know you people out there, none of you struggle with any of these issues, but I still do. It's a deliberate crossing of the line. In fact, one of the comments that the uh, cross of Christ makes is that Understanding sin is an underlying hostility toward God, whether you're aware of it or not. I'm going to say many of us are not aware of it, but it's there. It's part of the sickness that's in our DNA called sin. If I want absolution, can I encourage you today? You should get it in writing. I have a little hint. It's in writing. That's why I have this. Just as a visual that it is in writing how we can get absolved from our guilt. We stand on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Dr. Ashley mentioned last night, quote, uh, last week, quoting uh, me, <laughs> the greatest mental health verse in the scripture. If we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us, that I, I, my spirit can be released. I can walk in freedom. My conscience is clear. What a valuable asset that is for the believer. A clear conscience. Some of us still don't have one, but we can. Look at this, Psalm 32. Comes out in all the, the records of uh, unpacking the book of Hebrews. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2a. How blessed is he. How blessed, how happy, some translations say, is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, who has absolution. You're off the hook. You don't have to pay for this yourself. You don't have to pay it back. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniqu uh, iniquity. You know, that's why the Old Testament used an animal slit at the throat so the blood gushes out. It doesn't get any more graphic or visual that sin has serious consequences. In other words, it should be you that is getting that. Are, are we connecting some of those dots? But there's a better covenant coming, a better last will and testament. Once and for all, 
better, final atonement. A couple of weeks back, I understand people really appreciated our time of communion. We were celebrating that reality that I can know my sin is forgiven, that I've been atoned for. And we sang the song at the opening today, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Perfect song for this morning. So, if you're out there and you're listening today, I want to just ask you, do you know and rely on the reality that Jesus' final, last will and testament, his payment on the cross is applied to you? Are you happy? Are you blessed knowing that your sin is covered? It's not held against you. You don't have to pay back. If we have to pay back, we're in trouble. Now, I also need to sidebar and say, sometimes Christians, when we talk about sin, don't fully get it. Like the comment I made a minute ago. Um, sin is an underlying hostility to God. Well, I don't have any of that in me. Let me give you an illustration. In the kind of rusty old file drawers in my brain, there's an old story of a revival movement in Korea. By the way, around the turn of the last century, the 1905 or so in there, there was great revivals around the globe, and Korea was one of those places. There are still phenomenal churches in South Korea, and uh, many, many solid Bible-teaching Presbyterian churches were moved by the Spirit of God in a great ingathering and work of the Spirit. In one of the stories, a Presbyterian pastor, by the way, they were the Bible-preaching guys, uh, was meeting with a woman who God was using in the revival. Is that allowed? Yeah, absolutely it is. And she was sitting down with this pastor, and here's how the conversation went. This is a pastor, remember? Pastors are perfect, right? <clears throat> no, people want you to be perfect, but no, they're not. And so uh, she's sitting down with this brother, and they're talking, and he couldn't think of anything that would be holding back the work of the Spirit in his life. So she asked him a few questions. And she said, um, what do you think is the meaning of this verse in Matthew chapter 6? But seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And he answered correctly. Well, that means that you should put God in first in all your decisions and how you live your life. He's first place. Everything works out of that. And she said, that's correct. And do you teach your people to do that? And he said, oh, yes, I certainly do. Thank you for answering honestly. Now, would you also answer this question? Can you say that you honestly put the kingdom first in every one of your decisions and actions? And he thought about it for a minute and said, no, I guess I'd have to admit that I don't. Then she asked, what would you call a person who says to people, do this, but does that? Being biblically illiter illiterate, he gave the right answer, a hypocrite. Very good. Would you write down, I am a hypocrite? And he wrote it down, and the Holy Spirit began to tear down his stubborn, proud heart. And he experienced revival. Sometimes we miss it. Think about that, beloved. Just think about that. Which brings us to the next thing. It's not just forgiveness that I need, an absolution. I need assistance. I need guidance how to live this out. What do I do now? Let's say I'm forgiven for the first time in my life. Let's say I invite Christ into my life and I know all of the rotten things I did, all of that drug junk and everything else just got wiped out. Yay, how do I live from this point on? Here's the question. Why do I go to a priest? <laughs> a brother or sister who is a priest of God, that's all of us, right? Why do I go to somebody to get connected with God, to have them pray with me? Because I want to know how to live to please God. The chief end of man is to enjoy God, right? To, to, uh, uh, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. How do I do that? I love that song we sang, the last one always chokes me. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. That's not just book knowledge about you. I read, I read all about the Gospels. I see what it says. No, it's experiential. It's enjoying God. It's learning how to walk with Jesus. Actually experiencing that. That's why sometimes Christians sound like they're crazy. Because I, I know Jesus. What do you mean? Did he come to your house for dinner last night? Well, not exactly. <laughs> but in a way. 
right? I know him. His spirit witnesses to me. It's experiential. It's not just book learning. The coming sections of the book of Hebrews are going to talk about this amazing covenant that God has established that includes our inheritance, a relationship with the Holy Spirit that is absolutely awesome. But before we get to that, let's make sure we're clear on a couple of things. One is, what does this mean? What does this verse mean out of Hebrews 7, 18? I'm quoting it from the New Jerusalem Bible because I think it says it better. The earlier commandment was abolished, remember? The old will and testament's done, got the new will, this one supersedes the old one, it's abolished because of its weakness and ineffectiveness. What? Sometimes we misunderstand what the scripture's saying, and sometimes, or if not often, we forget what the goal. What is the goal of all this? Where's God trying to take us? We misunderstand what the scripture's telling us. So let me help us a little bit. The law made nothing perfect. Verse 19 of today's reading said, the law made nothing perfect. What is perfect? It makes nothing come to completion or maturity. It doesn't accomplish the goal. That's what it's saying. And when it says the law was weak or, in, or uh, uh, I forgot what one of the words was, weak, broken, doesn't, doesn't accomplish it, Useless, that was the word. It means ineffective, unhelpful, unprofitable. Why? Is it because the law is bad? Is it because God made a mistake? Is it because if you tried to follow the law, you would sin? Um, can I give you a little hint? If you tried to follow the Ten Commandments, you probably wouldn't sin a lot. It's really, those are good moral laws. Here's what it means, and we're going to unpack it by using the words of Paul. Just two verses I'm going to fly through. Galatians 3, 21 and 24. Is the law contrary to the promises of God? Sometimes Christians get this confused. May it never be. If there was a law that was given that was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But it doesn't bring us to the goal. Why doesn't it? We're going to find out in a second. Therefore... The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. The law says thou shalt not do all of these things. It tells not only what God is displeased by, it also tells us what he's pleased by. What does God require of you, O man? Right? Love righteousness, do mercy, show mercy, walk humbly with your God. Those are the positives. And what we find is we always miss it. That's the problem. So I need to let this sacrifice of Jesus pay for my failure. Friend, you can't earn eternal life. I'm going to park here for just a second because I'm sure there are people listening in uh, that may have this wrong. We live in a culture that does not like to think about what happens. Do I have the real spiritual unseen world wrapped up in a last will and testament that I'm sure about. Instead, we kind of like, I don't want to think about that. Even in a COVID-19 crisis, we're like panicking about what if I get sick, but are, am I preparing in any way, not just to survive COVID, but am I prepared to survive death itself? And what we do is we tend to live in denial, and, I, and most of the people I interact with, and maybe you found it to be the same, and maybe you're thinking what I'm about to say. Gee, I think if I say, uh, what happens when you die? What, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I'm hoping, because most people think there's some kind of sorting out afterwards. There's a good place and a bad place of some sort. I'm hoping that, you know, I've been a pretty good person. I haven't done anything really terrible. Haven't robbed the Circle K. Oh, they have Circle Ks around here? No. I lived in the Southwest too long, okay? <laughs> you know, the Quick Mart. Uh, I didn't do anything bad like that. I didn't cheat on my spouse, whatever it happens to be. So what we do is we think like this. There's a wall. I'm going to use a visual. There's a wall. You have to decide for yourself where you think you're sitting. There's a wall, maybe a nice block wall, about 12 inches thick. On one side is heaven, on the other side is the other place, not heaven. Okay, it's called hell, all right? Separation, bad. 
On the top of this wall is a fulcrum, you know, like a seesaw. While you're alive, you're able to keep your balance on that seesaw. You're standing up there on the fulcrum. Ooh, one side's great, that side's not great. Which side do you want to fall on? We all want to fall on that side. And here's what we think. On the fulcrum, God is piling up all our good deeds over here and all our bad deeds over here. And if I can just get enough good deeds or not enough, not a lot of bad deeds, then when I can't keep my balance anymore, which is the minute I breathe my last, the weight of those good deeds is going to drop that fulcrum and I'm going to slide into the good place. If you're there in your head, you're missing eternal life. The gift of life is that, exactly that, a gift. You don't earn it. You're never going to be able to earn enough to make the fulcrum go that way. You need a rescuer who puts all his righteousness on your good side. and That's how you drop in when you breathe your last. Let me encourage you to search that out. You can contact us through the website, we'd be happy to answer questions of how to put your trust in this great Savior, Jesus, who's the surety in writing of eternal life. Get it in writing. Now let me go one step further and I'll be done. Further for the believer, the person who has put their trust in Christ, you can't live the Christian life. Hate to tell you. You can't. Not alone. You can't by yourself. You need help. So I want you to look for it now in this next verse. Look for the answer. What's the ticket? How do I please God? How do I know that I'm living in connection with him and doing okay? How do I know? What the law could not do, Romans 8 tells us, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Here's the ticket. In order that the requirement, what is the requirement of God? To live to his pleasure. How do I know that I'm pleasing God? The requirement of the law, that's why the law was given, to live in a way that pleases God. We couldn't do it because of our sin. That's the problem. We need a power that overcomes that, that we might fulfill the requirement of the law, fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but how? According to the Spirit. That's the ticket, laddie. That new life of walking in the Spirit. Let me repeat it with more clarity out of the Jerusalem Bible again. This was so the law's requirements might be fully satisfied in us. Isn't that awesome? What God has already done for me in Jesus satisfies every request. No more need to slit the throat. It's done. But not only that, as we direct our lives not by our natural inclinations, but by the Spirit. Under his leading, he takes the truths of the word. This is what we mess up sometimes when we think we're free from the law. We're free from legalism. We're not free from God's moral law. He takes the truth of the scripture and makes it live through us. And we understand what it means. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It means how I think, not just what I do. Don't bear false witness doesn't just mean in court. It means tell the truth all the time. The Spirit takes that and makes it live through us. I don't know about you. I get all excited about this stuff. All right. See, the law is good. All right. But it is not sufficient to bring us to maturity. I want to read something from one of the commentators named Lang. And he said this about the law. Visualize, if you will, the description of the Old Testament saints who have just been rescued out of Egypt. They just got rescued. Remember that wonderful Exodus story? Charlton Heston, all that. It was awesome. And here's what he says. It is to be noted that the law at Sinai was not given to effect salvation from wrath, the angel of destruction. That was already beaten. That already happened. They were gone. And freedom from Satan, that was Pharaoh, but to guide and rule men already redeemed and free. The guilty it could not justify nor grant life from the dead, but it could bless the living. That's what the word of God is. It's something to bless the living. If they would render obedience, this it can do today. If the Christian will render loving obedience. The saint of old could say, oh, how I love thy law. It's my meditation all the day, Psalm 119. 
the saint today can say with Paul, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. It's real. It comes to life. Both they of old and we can taste the word of God and see that it is good. Hope that clarifies a little bit. We don't say, oh, that, that, that doesn't matter what the Bible says. And I've heard Christians talk like that, and it's foolishness. The Holy Spirit uses the word to fill us up with Jesus. He really does. This book that we're reading is aiming us toward an amazing new covenant to walk in the Spirit. My question for every brother and sister, does it matter to you whether you're walking in the Spirit? Please. Walking in the Spirit, to please God, to know that, to enjoy him forever. It's interesting to note they, these saints that were being written to in the book of Hebrews, they wanted to go back to what felt safe for them. They wanted to get away from the stigma of being a follower of Jesus. In those days, persecution was their possibility if they were naming the name of Jesus. But if they could go back to what they were comfortable with, they'd fly under the radar. What if the COVID virus is just the beginning of the end and we're going to see the book of Revelation start to unravel? What if that were to happen? Where are you at? Is that confidence of the Spirit carrying me through? I mean, I know I'm in a good place no matter what. Or do I want to go back to old business as usual? You know, we all have a default mode where we want to, uh, it's more comfortable to go over here and not press forward. What's your default? What religious assumption keeps you held back? I'm going to close with this little story from uh, Tim Keller's book, The Prodigal God, and it's based on the story of the prodigal, and you all know that. I don't have to unpack it. But he makes this one little comment about the gospel, that there are people who feel like they're the good guys because they're doing what's right, and they're pretty sure that they're pleasing God, and there are people who know they're in rebellion, and they're going the other way. So he calls those the elder brothers, and he calls the younger ones, you know, the prodigals, the younger brothers. And he makes this comment. He says this, elder brothers divide the world in two. The good people like us are in, and the bad people who are running around partying, or I'm, this is my commentary, you know, they're doing their naughty stuff. They're the bad ones, uh, the good people like us are in, and those uh, who run around, they're the real problem with the world. They're out. Younger brothers, even if they don't believe in God at all, do the same thing. They say, nope, the open-minded and tolerant people are in, and the bigoted, narrow-minded, can I dare say, church-going, they're the ones that are out. They're the real problem in the world. But Jesus says, the humble are in, and the proud are out. And if you can't do the math, both of those people are proud. There's the problem. The people who confess they aren't particularly good or open-minded are moving toward God because the prerequisite for receiving grace is to know you need it. The people who think they are just fine, thank you very much, are moving away from God. In other words, yes, there are people even in my church who are just like the Presbyterian pastor who couldn't see how far from God he really was. Let me encourage you to get it in writing. You've got it, an irrevocable covenant. It's recorded in the word of God, and by the way, it's signed with the very blood of Jesus himself. Get it in writing and make it your own. Absolution and assistance are yours if you're willing to press on to the better things that have been written for you. We'd love to help you and coach you in the right direction. I'm going to ask you to join me as I close in prayer. Amen. Lord, thank you for your love for us and that you have solved the problem of sin. We're not tapping in enough, but <laughs> the world isn't tapping in enough, but you have commanded a victory over all sin. And we want that power flowing, that wonderful new covenant working with authority in our lives so that the very life of Jesus might be seen. Knowing not only absolution, but knowing we have your assistance to live a life that pleases you and delight in that. Help your people. Help those who are listening in. 
who recognize I need to settle. I need to not be sitting on that seesaw on the wall wondering what's going to happen. Let them make a decision to follow Jesus and slide over into the good side. Help us, we pray today. In the great name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people out there said, amen and amen. God bless you. See you next time.